sitting on that side of the desk myself. So I thought I can run you through some of the things that I've been uh, doing in the past uh, 10 years or so and give you an overview of computational science and engineering. Uh, my name is Chandra Anwarapu. Um, I joined the civil engineering faculty here um, just about 10 days ago. And let me walk you through uh, some of the path that I took to get here. So like I said, um, I was sitting on the other side of the desk about 12 years ago. I was, I'm a BTEC in civil engineering from IIT Madras myself and I remember taking this course uh, back when I think Professor Matthews was coordinating uh, the lecture series. And I also remember being very wide-eyed, uh, not knowing what, not just civil engineering but what engineering is. Uh, you know, I would confuse, routinely confuse engineering with science. I think you guys are way ahead of me in the game because as I understand this is the internet age. You have your phone in your hands, you have Wikipedia, you have Quora, I don't know, you have all these avenues of information. So you must know a lot more than me about civil engineering. Um, I would have made this lecture a lot more interactive but I understand that they are recording me so whatever you say maybe we cannot get that on the video. But let's have that discussion uh, when we have a Q&A sometime later. So after my BTEC, uh, I, um, I liked what I was doing, so I went ahead and did a PhD in um, computational mechanics, which is, uh, which sounds very fancy, but you know, it is a subfield of mechanical, civil and aerospace engineering. So I will talk a lot more about this in the talk, but um, after doing my PhD, I went ahead and worked at a Department of Energy National Laboratory for five years. Um, sort of expanding on what I did in my PhD and developing these large-scale uh, simulation platforms to simulate reality, uh, more or less in the geoscience space. Uh, I'll talk some of that, talk about some of that later too. And I worked at ExxonMobil Corporation, also as a computational scientist, and now uh, back, back here I am uh, to, to maybe make your life easy or difficult, I don't know, we'll see. Okay. Um, so, before we get into any of what um, these, uh, these computational sciences, what computational engineering is, uh, let's start with the basics. So, uh, for any of these uh, principles, we need to simulate reality. And uh, when you talk about simulation, the definition is out there for you. You can see it's essentially defining a computational model that is simple enough for you to study and predict any of the physical events that happen um, outside in nature. Well, that's a very drab definition. I don't know how many of you would be able to relate to it. So I thought that I'll play a clip of a movie. Let's see how to get rid of the laser pointer. So I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. It's a movie called Sully, where basically it's about um, a real event where the pilot tries to land the aircraft in Hudson River because he realizes that it's going to crash otherwise. So what they're trying to do here is they are trying to uh, figure out whether that was the best course of action for him to take or whether he should actually have followed the guidance that was give, given to him by air traffic controllers and go and land it in a nearby airport. So if you haven't seen this movie, I highly recommend it by the way. All right, uh, Tom Hanks has asked us to get serious, so we have to get serious, I guess. Uh, so what he's really trying, what they were really trying to do there is essentially run a flight simulator. So uh, that was a practical example of what simulation is. It tries to mimic reality. You try to model a real event and see what would happen when you can't really do it as an experiment. So just to give you a quick overview, uh, you have a physical process and for you to simulate it on the computer, you have to come up with a simple enough model uh, 
um, which you can uh, mimic on the computer. And for you to develop this simple model, you need to come up with assumptions and simplifications of the physical reality. So, and once you have the simplified mathematical model, then you have to approximate it on the computer using some sort of um, discretization. So, you break a, a, a complex geometrical shape into many tiny pieces and you solve this simple mathematical model on those, each of those tiny pieces. You solve for the desired quantities and then you start reiterating, you start iterating on the loop. So, you relax any assumptions you think that you, that should not have been there in the first place and then you keep solving till you are satisfied with what you obtain as desired quantities. But in this process, what happens is that because of the many assumptions and simplifications, your mathematical model may just be that, it's a model, it may not necessarily be reality and that's why it's always good to keep this uh, pithy saying at the back of your mind, that is that all models are wrong, but some models can be useful. What that means is that models can be informative, uh, they can within certain application areas, the assumptions that you are making may in fact be reasonable enough. So, what this uh, framework allows you to do is that it is an extension of theoretical science. So, all these um, um, pen and paper calculations that you are used to doing, uh, they are very good for really simple problems, but when it comes to complicated reality, you may not be able to do those things on pens and paper because it may just take too long for you to do them or you may just have too many variables in place that you cannot necessarily solve any of these. These are, this method for science and engineering is a very good alternative to experiments and observations. And the reason for that is, maybe alternative is not the right word, I think it is a very good complement to experiments and observations. And the reason for that is that experiments can be really, really expensive. And the so same goes for observations, there are many there are many phenomena that you may not be able to observe either with um, just your eyes or because of the spatial location, you know like you do not know what is happening in Mars unless you land a Curiosity rover there, right. Exploring new theories, um, uh, designing experiments to test these theories out and advance scientific knowledge. For example, the Higgs boson, I mean we are going into particle physics right now, but Professor Higgs had uh, come up with this particle way back in the 1960s and then they devised experiments, they went into the, I mean you may have heard of the particle accelerator at CERN and then they uh, did all these colliding, uh, particle colliding experiments and then they were able to verify his predictions that he made way back in 1960s and there are several computational models out there which were able to predict it. So, these computational models are able to help you design these alternate experiments that could eventually advance scientific knowledge. More advantages, um, so like I said, unlike most theory, theoretical uh, arguments which are always predicated on idealized systems. Let us go back to your high school physics, right, what do you start with? Let us assume things are in vacuum in a frictionless state or something like that and that is never what happens in the real world. So, uh, this simulation based uh, science and engineering tries to address those limitations and you come up with models for real systems and like I think mentioned in the last slide, uh, unlike experiment desi experimental designs and tests, we are not necessarily as constrained by cost. I mean these things will still cost, right, I mean you have to basically run these models on a maybe a supercomputer, you have to have very advanced people who are developing these models and writing these large scale codes. So, there is, there is a cost to all of it, but that is nothing as compared to the cost of let us say an equipment that is available only for some hundreds of crores of rupees or millions of uh, US dollars, right. Moreover, you can run any of these models on the computer screen without worrying about what sort of adverse effects it is causing on the environment or the health of the person who is running these experiments because I mean this is a virtual laboratory, it is not a real laboratory. So, the regulations and restrictions that you need to place on them are also much smaller. So, let me set the stage for this video. So, 
the idea behind uh, this presentation I'm giving is uh, to give you some sort of an overview of what application areas are available for these simulations and these computational models that we develop. And one of the areas is energy sector, which is where I worked for about five and a half years now. So I have a very good understanding of and I can sort of relate to it uh, how these computational models are actually addressing real world challenges, how they are making oil and gas recovery much more efficient and how uh, that translates into real world money and engineering. So what I have here is a video from this company called Marathon Oil Corporation. Uh, this operates in uh, Texas in the United States of America and uh, they are very heavily focused on extracting unconventional oil and gas sources and what unconventional oil and gas sources means is that Till not long ago, these sources were uh, considered to be um, very economically unviable because of where they are and how less um, permeable the rocks where these uh, oil and gas resources sit. So for you to actually extract them, you have to spend in so much money that by the time they come out into the market, they are no longer economically profitable. But because of technological advancements, uh, in the past decade or so, these, uh, these resources have become economically viable and um, simulation has a large part to play, uh, play in that and here uh, I think this video will explain what the real world engineering challenges are and then we'll go back and look at how simulation can actually address some of those challenges. Geologists have known for years that substantial deposits of oil and natural gas are trapped in deep shale formations. These shale reservoirs were created tens of millions of years ago. Around the world today, with modern horizontal drilling techniques and hydraulic fracturing, the trapped oil and natural gas in these shale reservoirs is being safely and efficiently produced, gathered, and distributed to customers. Let's look at the drilling and completion process of a typical oil and natural gas well. Shale reservoirs are usually one mile or more below the surface, well below any underground source of drinking water, which is typically no more than 300 to 1,000 feet below the surface. Additionally, steel pipes, called casing, cemented in place, provide a multi-layered barrier to protect freshwater aquifers. During the past 60 years, the oil and gas industry has conducted fracture stimulations in over 1 million wells worldwide. The initial steps are the same as for any conventional well. A hole is drilled straight down using fresh water based fluids, which cools the drill bit, carries the rock cuttings back to the surface, and stabilizes the wall of the well bore. Once the hole extends below the deepest freshwater aquifer, the drill pipe is removed and replaced with steel pipe, called surface casing. Next, cement is pumped down the casing. When it reaches the bottom, it is pumped down and then back up between the casing and the borehole wall, creating an impermeable additional protective barrier between the well bore and any freshwater sources. In some cases, depending on the geology of the area and the depth of the well, additional casing sections may be run and, like surface casing, are then cemented in place to ensure no movement of fluids or gas between those layers and the groundwater sources. What makes drilling for hydrocarbons in a shale formation unique is the necessity to drill horizontally. Vertical drilling continues to a depth called the kickoff point. This is where the well bore begins curving to become horizontal. One of the advantages of horizontal drilling is that it's possible to drill several wells from only one drilling pad, minimizing the impact to the surface environment. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe is removed and additional steel casing is inserted through the full length of the well bore. Once again, the casing is cemented in place. For some horizontal developments, new technology in the form of sliding sleeves and mechanical isolation devices replace cement in the creation of isolations along the well bore. Once the drilling is finished and the final casing has been installed, the drilling rig is removed and preparations are made for the next steps, well completion. The first step in completing a well is the creation of a connection between the final casing and the reservoir rock. This consists of lowering a specialized tool called a perforating gun, which is equipped with shaped explosive charges, down to the rock layer containing oil or natural gas. This perforating gun is then fired, which creates holes through the casing, 
cement, and into the target rock. These perforating holes connect the reservoir and the well bore. Since these perforations are only a few inches long and are performed more than a mile underground, the entire process is imperceptible on the surface. The perforation gun is then removed in preparation for the next step, hydraulic fracturing. The process consists of pumping a mixture of mostly water and sand, plus a few chemicals, under controlled conditions into deep underground reservoir formations. The chemicals are generally for lubrication, to keep bacteria from forming, and help carry the sand. These chemicals typically range in concentrations from 0.1 to 0.5% by volume, and help to improve the performance of the stimulation. This stimulation fluid is sent to trucks that pump the fluid into the well bore and out through the perforations that were noted earlier. This process creates fractures in the oil and gas reservoir rock. The sand in the frac fluid remains in these fractures in the rock and keeps them open when the pump pressure is relieved. This allows the previously trapped oil or natural gas to flow to the well bore more easily. This initial stimulation segment is then isolated with a specially designed plug and the perforating guns are used to perforate the next stage. This stage is then hydraulically fractured in the same manner. This process is repeated along the entire horizontal section of the well, which can extend several miles. Once the stimulation is complete, the isolation plugs are drilled out and production begins. Initially water and then natural gas or oil flows into the horizontal casing and up the well bore. In the course of initial production of the well, approximately 15 to 50 percent of the fracturing fluid is recovered. This fluid is either recycled to be used on other fracturing operations or safely disposed of according to government regulations. The whole process of developing a well typically takes from three to five months, a few weeks to prepare the site, four to six weeks to drill the well, and then one to three months of completion activities, which includes one to seven days of stimulation. But this three to five month investment can result in a well that will produce oil or natural gas for 20 to 40 years or more. When all of the oil or natural gas that can be recovered economically from a reservoir has been produced, work begins to return the land to the way it was before the drilling operations commenced. Work will be filled with cement and pipes cut off three to six feet below ground level. All surface equipment will be removed and all pads will be filled in with dirt or replanted. The land can then be used again by the landowner for other activities, and there will be virtually no visual signs that a well was once there. Today, hydraulic fracturing has become an increasingly important technique for producing oil and natural gas in places where the hydrocarbons were previously inaccessible. Technology will continue to be developed to improve the safe and economic development of oil and gas resources. So, there is a lot to process in that video. I mean, it's essentially describing the entire process from the time when they actually drill the well uh, to the time when they close the well and the production is complete. But uh, routinely, many engineering decisions are being made there. Like, how do you drill under the ground? See, so one thing to remember is that there is nothing that you can see under the subsurface, right? So, it's all uh, essentially a black box and you have to make these decisions which have real world implications. So, you either do it based on a uh, trial and error approach, right? So, you drill one well, you, you look at the performance of this well and then you go back and then you learn from this, whatever you learn from this uh, drilling this well and go ahead and maybe uh, use lo those learnings to drill another well. But, one thing to remember is that geology uh, of the terrain there will change uh, based on the location where you're drilling the well. So, the learnings from one well may not necessarily translate into another one. Um, if you look at the process there, uh, there is fluid flowing through uh, the porous medium which is the rock, right? Then you're pumping in uh, pressurized fluid into the well so that you can fracture the rocks which you need to so that you can enhance the permeability of these shale formations so that natural gas can be extracted in an economically viable manner. Then you are also injecting sand particles, so that the fractures remain open once you create them. Because otherwise, the earth is so compressed that you may create a fracture, but as soon as you stop pumping the fluid, they will all shut. And that basically 
makes this entire process uh, futile. So, like I said, since it's a black box, you have no idea what's happening under the subsurface. Um, and uh, a lot of the engineering practices are uh, empirical. They have been doing things um, in the past, in the past 10 or 20 years, and they just keep following the same processes. But there's a lot of room for improvement by applying science and technology. And that's where simulations come in. You can actually model this entire process on a computer through first principles, where you, um, so each of these processes can be represented by a computational model. How does fluid flow through a porous medium? That is a computational model. How does the rock break when you inject a pressurized fluid into the, into the rock? That is a computational model. And um, when you inject sand particles, then um, how does this mix in with water? How do these sand particles mix in with water? How do the additives and the chemicals mix in with, wat with water? And how do they prop up in these fractures? This is a computational model. And the, all these computational models are linked together. So you have to essentially solve them in a coupled manner to obtain what you think may be happening under the surface and then uh, translate those results back to the engineers who are trying to make decisions real time. And uh, just to set the context, each of these wells cost in tens of millions of dollars. So, if you, if you are able to recommend that you are not drilling one well, that results in a lot of cost savings. And the kind of uh, decisions that they are trying to make is how are these wells spaced? Are they spaced in a uniform manner or are they spaced in certain patterns so that you are able to extract, let us say, this piece of land to its maximum capacity? And uh, the results are for all to see. I mean, United States used to be a net importer of energy, I mean very much like our own country which imports um, to meet, imports oil and natural gas to meet most, most of its energy demands. But since uh, they have uh, uncovered a lot of these uh, shale deposits, they are now becoming a net exporter of, of uh, energy. So, and this has huge implications for a country's economy. For example, you may notice every time oil price goes up, our, uh, the rupee depreciates and we go, our country goes into a lot of debt because we have to purchase these, uh, our energy demands are not going down. Our energy demands are only going up with the number of people uh, uh, increasing, right? So, so as um, oil prices go up, it has a huge cost on our country. So science and technology can actually have a huge impact on how to actually um, uh, meet our energy demands uh, and also improve our economy. So here is an example of um, how this can be simulated in a computer um, and this I am pulling from one of my collaborators at the University of Illinois. So they are modeling hydraulic fracturing process that you just saw as a fully uh, coupled multi-physics process on the computer. So the cylindrical object that you see on the screen is actually a, a well and you have two perforations that are created. And now you are uh, trying to drive those fractures uh, by injecting pressurized fluid. So let us see what happens. So you see the fracture starts growing with increasing pressure. So the pressure exceeds the failure stress of the rock and that essentially results in, an, uh, in a growing fracture. And what you do notice is that as one fracture interacts with the other, you have a fully three dimensional shape of the fracture that uh, does not necessarily um, uh, is not necessarily obvious to us in a mental picture, right? We would think that the fractures are probably growing uh, straight because they have been initiated at the same location. But you have a, a tortuosity there in the near uh, well bore region. And uh, this essentially has an impact on what the, how the engineer should essentially uh, tailor their perforation. Maybe having two perforations really uh, close to one another is not such a good idea, right? This is a recommendation that can be made. Maybe if you have one stage of hydraulic fracturing operations, having multiple clusters uh, may or may not be um, economically uh, profitable. Here is another example where you have several natural fractures, which is essentially when you have uh, the earth's geology, in addition to the fractures that you are creating by injecting pressurized fluid. There's already many, many fractures that exist because of a tectonic activity and geologic folding. And here we are trying to 
um, mimic those natural factors based on certain data uh, which are oriented in certain directions. And if you look at um, uh, a hydraulic fracture that is being driven uh, in somewhere in the middle of those fractures, we try to look at how that uh, hydraulic fracture interacts with the natural factors around it. So the colors that you're seeing are essentially uh, the concentration of uh, the propent that you're injecting and how the fluid flows from the main hydraulic fracture that you see here into the surrounding natural fractures. Okay, so moving on to the next example area, it's not just geosciences where these simulation based technologies are useful. Uh, automobile crashes, uh, crash tests have been um, one of the signature uh, uh, use cases for this uh, uh, simulation based science and engineering approaches. And what I'm showing here is actually a real crash test. So this is, you can go to YouTube and look at, if you're interested in uh, how impacts affect crash, uh, cars, then you can look at several videos. And here a BMW is being uh, driven at um, 40 miles per hour into a rigid barrier. And you look at what that impact does to the car and also uh, to, a, to a driver who's sitting in there. So this essentially makes us uh, based on these impact tests, we can uh, design safety uh, features in a car and uh, they also make sure that we meet any safety requirements that are set forward by the government. So you see what happens there. And this is why you should always drive safely. So this is a real crash test. So you see the car crashing into the barrier, uh, getting smashed in the front and the airbags deploying. I don't think we need the music over there, but but um, we can actually simulate this process on a computer. Uh, we don't need to crash several of these BMWs, right? Uh, every time we want to test a new safety feature, and if you look at this this model of the exact same uh, scenario, you notice how similar the pattern is. And this is not a video game, by the way. This is, this is simulating the equations of physics which are um, close to what happens in real life. And there are assumptions, but this is nowhere near as bad as a video game. So now you notice in the structure of the car where the maximum deformation is and where would you need to put in any uh, augmentations or uh, any safety augmentations that you would require. Going forward, um, there is also medical sciences where simulations are uh, making their foray and uh, there is a lot of similarity between medical sciences and engineering, right? So, uh, but uh, there is no concept of predictions in medical sciences. In engineering, we try to predict a lot. We try to predict the future. I mean, um, yes, um, we are assuming that uh, our world, the, the world view we have is deterministic and we try to basically assume that the inputs are given to us and they are known, but we can probably translate a lot of that into a medical sciences as well. Uh, although there is no formal process to predict the outcome of a treatment for any individual patient, we may be able to based on the simulation based engineering sciences and methodologies. So what I'm showing here is essentially a full model of a full grown human heart. And it is an extremely complicated thing to model because again, you have blood flow flowing through the arteries, you have this complicated geometrical shape and you have tissues which are deforming under um, pressure from the blood which uh, flows in the arteries, right? So all these processes need to be accounted for when you're trying to simulate this. But if you can actually develop this kind of a model, 
you can have customized treatments for individual patients based on the data that you get from that patient because you know you can run you can take that data you can give that as an input to your computational model and you can run the model and you can see what happens let's say to drug delivery or what are the hot spots where uh, there is any artery cloggage etc and this model was developed in collaboration with IBM at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and um, it uses uh, high performance computing as well uh, to model the entire process. There is also another company is a personalized medicine. Another company which tries to uh, take forward these uh, ideas that I just presented and uh, it's trying to sell these softwares to hospitals right now and let's see uh, what happens over there. So you see the advantages there, instead of going for an invasive procedure, you can take a CT scan, develop a full blown computational model, run the tests, um, look at the various treatments even because you can look at whether, uh, you know, if you are prescribing a medicine, medicine, what the drug delivery does, uh, does it narrow uh, any blockages you have or does, is it ineffective and based on that you can come up with an um, customized treatment for every patient. So um, in conclusion, I would say that these methodologies, the simulation based science and engineering approaches are extremely powerful and they have only been possible because our computing power has increased exponentially in the past 20 years. However, there is, um, there is a, a downside to what I just mentioned, uh, since the computational power is increasing exponentially. We also want to use increasingly complicated models um, to model simple things. And as you may have heard uh, this quote from Albert Einstein, uh, your model should be the simplest possible it can be, but no simpler, right? So if you're trying to use a, a full uh, multi-physics approach to model something simple, you're not only wasting computational resources, but you're also making it hard for you to interpret what the results themselves mean. Um, again, since these are predictive capabilities, we have to be careful in interpreting the results and there have to be rigorous frameworks for validating and verifying these models. And moreover, like I said, we have a deterministic worldview, but the world is not uh, deterministic, right? I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty in the world. So there have to be rigorous approaches to quantify this uncertainty so that we can use these uh, computational models in a truly predictive sense. Um, as you saw, uh, most of the real world has complex geometries. So we do need methods for rapid, rapidly generating these models on really complicated uh, geometries and varying spatially and temporally varying material properties. And uh, in, the current, in the current world where uh, increasingly we have more and more data available, we can couple these physics based simulations with data driven modeling approaches. And uh, you may have smart simulations where your gridding may not be done manually. It can be done uh, through some sort of a machine learning or a neural net approach 
your constitutive models which can be which can, which may not necessarily be prescribed by you but it can be um, developed using some sort of a deep neural network etc um, so this is i think uh, the future of where um, engineering and science is headed and um, i would be open to any questions that you may have hopefully this piqued your interest into what civil engineering you know i mean civil engineering seems very far away from uh, computational science and engineering but to make the connection all the equations that i all the models that uh, simulate these processes are based on engineering mechanics so you guys are in first semester so you may not have done any mechanics of deformable bodies yet but you have looked at mechanics of statics rigid bodies and uh, dynamics of rigid bodies right so essentially the same principle apply to deformable bodies so when you say rigid bodies you're making an assumption in your model right it's essentially it says that your body doesn't deform at all so same principles extended to deformable bodies can do all these things and more right i mean it makes uh, human flight possible it makes um, the possibility of us landing on the moon or on the mars right so there's a lot we can achieve uh, through these approaches so hopefully this uh, generates some interest uh, on what you can do with your civil engineering degree thank you